Questions from God, number 12. Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 30. Who do you say I am? Let me just read the passage for us before I continue. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. I asked you to stand up and walk around and just kind of stretch and, and wake yourselves up. It's because I think it's, there's possibility that today's topic or some of the things I'm going to talk about may put you to sleep. That's why I wanted to make sure that you are up and try to stay up as much as you can. But with that said, please, please pay attention to it as much as you can because if you just get this, I think it has potential to um, change your lives. Um, as I believe every week, but more so because I feel that this is so relevant. One of those sermons, right, like where I feel like, man, is this more relevant for KC today, but not for EC, but some other Sundays, is this really more relevant for EC and not for KC? And I have this like wrestling that I do every week. And, and, and you know, when it's joyful, it's more, I call it a dance I do every week. But anyway, but today it's both ways. I feel like it, uh, it's so relevant to all of us. All of you here, and if we could just get this, it has potential to just shift our faith life in a positive way. So I just wanted to encourage you and begin with that. So Mark chapter 8. So this is from Mark, Gospel of Mark. When we open up the book of Mark from chapters 1 to 8, we see Jesus coming onto the scene. And then he calls the disciples to himself, and he travels around and ministers to show that the kingdom of God has come. And this is why many amazing things happen through him. Healing, amazing authoritative teaching, signs and wonders that he does. Well, it's great that he does all these miracles, but the main point of all these is that to show that in the person of Jesus, the kingdom of God has come. And many who saw this got excited. And they welcomed Jesus and they embraced Jesus into their lives. But what's ironic and sad and tragic is that in the midst of this, there's also a growing of um, tension, escalation of tension against Jesus. You think that everyone would welcome Jesus, but many actually end up becoming very hostile. So in this growing tension between those who receive him openly and others who continue to reject him and be hostile to him. It is in that tension, Jesus today in chapter 8 asked his disciples these two questions. What were they? Who do people say I am? First question. Who do you say I am? The second question. Jesus asked two questions. Now, which of the two questions is the one that Jesus is really wanting to ask to the disciples. Obviously, the second one. Because he wants to ask them, who do you say I am? But he asks two questions. And he asks the question that he really wants to ask for the second question. So we're going to look at the second one and see what that means for us. Actually, we're going to look at them both together. But I want to first ask you this question. If Jesus is really after the second question that he wants to ask, why bother asking the first question in the first place? Does he need to ask the first question? Why couldn't he just ask them, who do you say I am? Why does he have to say, who do people say I am? Who do you say I am? Why does Jesus ask that question first? Well, I've always had this question, but from a conversational perspective, this makes good sense. Now, I'm asking all the husbands that are in the house today. You know, you come home from a long day's work and muddy warm and you're, you're tired at the end of the day. You come back home and, and, you know, your wife's working too. So she comes home and you sit down at a table together and looking at each other and you're having this wonderful meal. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, your wife makes contact with your eyes and she says, Honey, do you love me? Out of nowhere. So when that question says, what do husbands do? Right away, you're thinking, 
What is going on? It, does she mean, why do you not love me anymore? Or is, this, is she really asking, what is going on? All kinds of thoughts go through your head. And then you're like, uh-oh, what did I do wrong? You're trying to count and recount your day and this past week. Okay, check everything. I can't really figure out what I did wrong. But, it, but what you do is you just look at her and say, I am sorry. <laughs> is this going to do it, right? Now, you know, if you carry on a conversation like that, it's just not a very good way of carrying conversation, right? So Jesus opens up, even though he wants to ask the second question, he first asks, who do people say I am? And then they'll be like, oh, yeah, uh, Elijah, you know, prophet. And then get them going, and then he asks, well, who do you? What about you? Who do you say I am? So for me, I've had this question of why the first question for many years, and I've always kind of uh, uh, seen it that way, where it's like this from a conversational perspective, it makes sense. But one time, I was actually reading some philosophy. Yes, this is where I might put you to sleep. But I was reading some philosophy and came across this branch of philosophy called epistemology. Now, does that word ring any bell to anyone here? Epistemology? Yes, 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 good, good, good. Epistemology is a branch within the field of philosophy that studies about knowledge. Epistemology, the word comes from two words combined, study and knowledge and study. So epistemology is study of knowledge. Well, what does that mean? More importantly, epistemology is focusing on the process through which we process and learn and gain new knowledge. What happens when we receive new information? How do we process it? How do we understand it? That's epistemology. Now, when we actually look into and go into epistemology, we could actually divide into big three different camps. On one hand, you have this school of thought called naive realism. You don't have to remember that, but just, just know that that word exists. And what naive realists believe when it comes to knowledge, study of knowledge, is that, well, there is such thing as objective knowledge, but how we human beings process and understand and gain that knowledge is away from, apart from our past experience, past tradition, culture, and experiences we bring into that process. So, it's that idea of I'm not bound by all these other things, but I, myself, independently, can come to a new topic and read it and understand it and process it through my own reason and ability. That's naive, re naive realism. Now, on the other side, you have philosophical skepticism. What that means is, well, there is really no such thing as objective truth. All we have is our interpretation. In fact, Whatever we try to learn, process new piece of uh, information into knowledge as our knowledge. Not only do we bring our past experience, we bring our tradition that we have. We're part of a culture that we can never escape. So we bring all these things into the process of knowing. And what happens is at the end of the day, we cannot claim that one interpretation is better than the other. But all we've got is just different interpretations. But then in the middle, you have what's called critical realism. And I think I belong to that camp. And what critical realism says is that there is this truth, objective truth there. And we are able to understand it and process it and become, make it become our own knowledge. But we don't do it independently of our past experience, tradition, culture that we are part of, that we bring into the process of knowing something. We're part of it, but it's ne not necessarily a bad thing. Because naive realism and naive realists will want to try to get away from that. No, we cannot bring our experience into it. We cannot bring our tradition into it because then we will be skewed in our process of knowledge. But critical realists will say, no, we bring those things into this process, but it's actually, we need them. Because those things, whether it's our tradition, our culture, past experience, become framework, much like I'm wearing my glasses, framework through which I see this new information and just 
like I cannot really see without my glasses. We need that framework called our tradition, culture, and past experience to be able to see this new knowledge, piece of information, and begin to understand it, begin to process it, and begin to make it our knowledge. Now, if you're confused, let me just quickly tell you why I'm talking about this. So if it is true that we bring our tradition, our past experience, our pre-knowledge into whatever that we information we're trying to process to learn about it or learn it, where do those things come from? Whether it's our tradition, our culture, or um, our experience, past experience, and so on. Well, we receive them, receive them through our community. So community is key here, and it is through the community that we come out of, we belong to, we receive these things, and they become framework, and we need it to understand this new piece of information. Why this is important to our passage today is because the fact that Jesus asked the first question, he's talking about this knowledge that disciples receive from their community. And without that, they cannot move to the second question. Who do you say I am? Only reason they're able to move to the second question and answer it is because they were able to answer the first question, which is, who do you, do other people say I am? What does your community say I am? And the people that you grew up with, people that taught you religious truth, who, what do they say who I am, right? So they say, well... Some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. Others say you are one of the prophets. Without that, they cannot go into the second question. This is why, if some of you are wondering, why did Jesus come as a Jewish person? It's because they had this communal knowledge through which people who saw Jesus can understand who Jesus is. Because they've had the, uh, they had the Old Testament, and Old Testament's talking about this Messiah that was going to come, prophesied about it, and Jesus comes, and then because they had this communal knowledge and um, that made up their um, uh, framework of understanding, they saw Jesus, and some of them were like, yeah, this is the one, the Messiah that the Old Testament, our Bible has been talking about. But the problem is, this communal knowledge that becomes our framework for understanding is important. What could also happen is that it could become our dogma. And you hold on to it so tightly that you are not able to move to new truth because it's become your dogma that you will never compromise with, for anything. And those who opposed Jesus and persecuted Jesus is a good example of this, right? They have the uh, community knowledge that they have received, pre-understanding about God and who He is. And then when they saw Jesus, they just couldn't get out of this framework. Instead of letting this frame, it became a dogma. How can God Come, into, come to us in human form. How can God be one in three? They just couldn't accept it because their previous pre-knowledge and pre-understanding has become this dogma that they cannot just get out of. Now, ready? Just breathe in. Let's take a break. Ready? Whew. Okay, you're still up, right? We're done. We're done. Now, let me bring this back to our passage today and bring it back to our faith, the level of our faith. Why am I explaining this to you? Not to just understand the process of the two questions, but through that, we can see this one thing. And we can ask ourselves this one question. And that question is this. Which question in your faith journey are you in right now? Is your faith journey one where you're stuck in the first question? 
And the only question you are asking and answering is, who do they say Jesus is? You're so stuck in your past experience. My faith experience from last year. My faith experience from five years ago. That you are just not able to receive this new blessing that God has for you in this season. Because whatever you experience has become a dogma. I'll give you an example of this. At One Hope, we have two different services where we can pray together corporately. One is the morning prayer service, and the other one is Friday night service, and Sunday too, but Friday night. Friday night service and the morning prayer are very different in nature because morning prayer, we're very silent, including even myself. You wouldn't hear a word come out of me during morning prayer. I don't pray out loud. Why? Because I love that silence as hard as it may seem to you <laughs> on Sundays. But I love that dead silence where in that silence, I hear this voice of God so clearly. But then we have the Friday night, and this is your typical, you know, Daniel that you see. And the typical maybe the Korean style prayer where we come and we shout and we scream and so on. So we got both. Now, there are some who grew up in their community and have grown up with the style of faith where they says, you know, I am actually a charismatic Christian. To, for us to really pray and experience, you know, the power of prayer, it's got to be loud. It's got to be powerful. It's got to be like, oh, you know, you're jumping up and down and loud prayer. And that's the only true way of awesome way of praying. If you're stuck in that framework of your own past experience, your belief, whatever you call it, you will never, ever experience that beauty and the glory of silent prayer. But then I have come across Christians who would tell me at times, you know, I grew up in a, a church that's very traditional. We didn't even clap. In fact, our pastor forbade us from clapping. How could you clap in a holy service? Stuck in one, and that becomes your dogma. You will never experience this other aspect of prayer that's so rich and so glorious. See, that's the problem. The first question is important. Without the first question, we cannot ask the second question. But if we get stuck in the first question, then our faith will not grow. It will just stay at that level. Not only that, be, it will become a dogma to you, and you will become so stubbornly dogmatic that you will become unhappy Christian, dissatisfied Christian, right? Oh, no, but this is not the way we used to do it many years ago, and now it's very uncomfortable for me. I don't really want anything to do with this. And your faith is stuck because you're stuck in the first question when Jesus wants to bring you to the second question. Who do you say I am? But those who do faith, life, in that second question, what happens is you bring your past experience, your knowledge, tradition that you have received, but that becomes a lens through which you see the Word of God in a different way, experience Him in a new way, and you continue to grow, and your faith and horizon of your faith expands, and you start to experience things that, that you've never experienced in the past because you are not stuck in your framework. They appreciate their tradition. They're grateful for the culture that they belong to. And they're thankful for the past experiences, even the faith experiences they had. But they don't get stuck in that first question. They move on. They keep moving forward because Jesus brings you to that next level and to that place. And the truth of God's word continues to and keeps forming them and transforming them because you are not stuck in your dogma. Think about how Peter was able to answer this. Who do you say I am? You are the Messiah. Is this book knowledge? 
This is something that Peter experienced, if you read the Gospel of Mark. He was a fisherman, and all he was doing was just fishing. And one day, Jesus walks by and says, come, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And he threw his net behind him, and he followed Jesus. That's how he come, came to see Jesus as the Messiah. His mother-in-law fell with this uh, uh, disease, and, and, and Jesus comes and just brings her back and heals her. And Peter saw that, and this knowledge that he has about Jesus being the Messiah is something that he saw firsthand. They were actually going together, journeying together in a ship. All of a sudden, the storm came, and the ship is about to be overturned. And Jesus wakes up from his sleep, and then he looks out to the sea, and he says, Quiet! Be still! And then the sea calmed down, and Peter saw that. And that's why he said, You are the Messiah! And this knowledge, this person by the name of Michael Polanyi, calls it personal knowledge. Real faith, true faith, is one where we don't get stuck in the first question. We keep moving on to the second question. Why I say this is relevant for you, not just for KC, but for you. Because it's possible, no, it's not possible, it is the case including myself, all of us, we get so stuck in that first question, do we not? No, we should not do faith that way because that was never the way it was done before. No, but I actually res don't respond in this way. And we get stuck in our framework of who we think we are. I'm telling you, I used to never scream during sermon. And maybe you're like, maybe that was good, Pastor Daniel. <laughs> never. It's just me just moving on to the second question. And I'm seeing something now that I didn't see before. That's why I do this. Hopefully that five years from now, when you continue to we journey together, that you see that he's changed again. I see something else now too. I sure hope that's the case. In what ways are you doing your faith? The first question way or the second question way? It's not third person knowledge. Who do you say I am? You are the Messiah. When Peter says, who do you say I am? You are the Messiah. He's saying, you are my Messiah. But here's a really awesome thing about all this conversation. Peter got to the second question, and he, he declared, yes, Jesus, you're the Messiah. And he's like, I got it, yes, I moved on to the next level. But then Jesus has something else in mind. That was just a stopover in this conversation. He wanted to take Peter to another place, which he didn't know. What it, where is that place? Look at verse 30. Okay, good, you know that I am the Messiah. Verse 31, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. What did he say? You know what? Good. You realize that I am the Messiah. But let me tell you now why I began this conversation in the first place. Here is the reason. You know what? Yes, I am that Messiah. But you know what kind of Messiah I am? the one that will die. And even Peter wasn't ready for this at this moment. So what does it say? Verse 32, he took Jesus aside and began to rebuke Jesus. Man, can you rebuke Jesus? I don't think I can, but Peter did. One bold man for sure. But what does Jesus do? Turn around, looked at his disciple. He rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concern of God, but merely human concerns. 
And then he called the crowd to him along with his disciple and said, Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Now, for you and I who stand in this vantage point and looking at the cross, we're like, of course, Jesus, he loved us and God loves us. He died for us. What's so, what's so odd about this? You're talking about this framework community where if you're a Jew and you grew up with their worldviews and all the teachings, Messiah, first of all, should not die. Not only that, Messiah should not die this kind of endless, shame-filled death because cross was the most humiliating death that was available. So even for Peter, who declared Jesus as Messiah, just still can't get this. Like, no! How can you die? How can you suffer? You shouldn't suffer. You're the Messiah. But notice, let's go back to the beginning of this passage, where this conversation takes place. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? In the Gospel of Mark, on the way, this is very significant because up until this point, Jesus is just traveling around Galilee region. He's not on the way. He's staying in the same region ministering. But with this conversation, that finished shift takes place where now he's on the way. On the way to where? Jerusalem. And Jerusalem to do what? To die. Why on the way? Now, that finished shift has taken place. Okay, these disciples have now understood that I am the Messiah. Now, on the way, I'm going to take them where I will die, and I'll become the Messiah who dies for them. And with this conversation, the whole story of Mark shifts dramatically now. And now they are on their way with Jesus to Jerusalem. In the same way, you and I are on the way. I have heard often mean this, but that's what's in their heart that comes out sometimes. There are those uh, believers often that I see time to time who just seem to suggest that they've done it all and they've experienced it all and they know it all. When it comes to faith, yeah, but I've done it. Yeah, the gospel, I know it. Yeah, there isn't anything I haven't experienced in the church. And that keeps them stuck in that first question. They stop journeying on the way. But we are on the way until the day we die and go to be with Christ. But no expectation. No new hope and desire because, you know, it's all the same. All the same. You know? Oh, yeah, you guys do cell church? Yeah, but, you know, I call it different names, but I've done it all and I've experienced it all. And we get stuck in our first question. Faith becomes so boring and dry because we just can't get out of that framework that's become our dogma. So I ask you, who is the Jesus that you know right now? Is he the same old Jesus that you knew from last year, three years ago, five years ago? Or is there any new mystery about this Jesus because you're discovering more about him, this depth of this relationship you have not experienced until now. Where are you? Where are you? As you know, I love praise songs, but in the last four or five years, I've come to love the hymnal so much. And there's something new because I'm picking a hymn every day during the week to sing for the morning service. But as I'm searching through the hymns and reading through the lyrics of the, all the hymns that we have in the hymnal, the best way I can put it is spiritually, it's so tasty. The hymnal lyrics are so good. Don't worry, we're not singing all hymns, you know, before you get scared and pack up and run away. We're not singing all hymns, but for me... That's something new. 
because I'm not stuck in that framework. Hymnals are for the old 200, 300 years ago. Maybe there's a reason why it lasted thousands of years. Maybe it's that good. But because I'm no longer stuck in that framework of first question, I get to experience it. Wow, it's so good. Every word is so full. Theology-wise, it's so rich when you read the hymn lyrics. But then recently, I was sitting in my office and I preparing for my week's uh, podcast and morning service. Then all of a sudden, this fear hit me. And that fear was this. I have, have promised our one old people that with you through morning podcast, I will go through the 66 books of the Bible. And by the grace of God, in the last five, six, six years now, we're like close to almost 50 books now. And it looks like I will definitely, barring like emergency that, you know, unseen happens, I will probably go through the 66 books and do the second round again with you. And by the time we do second round, you know, even with EC, I'll start right from the beginning and all the way to all the 66 books. But then as I was doing that, fear hit me. And that fear was this. What if when I go through the second time around, go through this? This joy and this mystery, amazement, stop. And I was really serious about this. It's not just like, oh, curiosity, thing, but it's like, because I'll have gone through the whole 66 books, chapter by chapter, I've gone through it all. I prepared a sermon pretty much almost chapter by chapter. What if second time around I do this, I'm like, ah, oh, I've seen this and done this. And what if that happens? It really concerned me in that moment. But then as I just sat there, I felt like this is what the Holy Spirit was telling me. Daniel, wake up <laughs> from your... <laughs> Wild imagination. I felt like he was saying this. Daniel, am I a book to you? Am I just a book to you that you read? Yes, if I'm just a book to you, maybe reading the same book second time around, third time around, fourth time around, because you know what happens and you know what will happen, that maybe it will be boring for you. But am I a book? written on a piece of paper. I am not a book. I am a personal God. I am perfect God, unending, unlimited. You could do this 300 times, and each time you find something new about me. Stop worrying about things that you don't even need to worry about. And then I was like, okay, thank you. Then I will finish 66. And then start again. Let me apologize in talking about my love story with Diane. But I will share it anyway, because I always do if I feel led to. And having a right in front of me, that just kind of makes it awkward too, but... So when we're dating, you know, like, as you could probably tell, I was so madly in love with her that I was, like, so passionate in, like, doing things for her. And one of the things I did was, do you guys know what a tape cassette is, any of you? Wait, I have to ask. Wait. Amy, Aaron, and Daniel, do you know what a tape cassette is? Okay, good, good. <laughs> so I recorded, I sang a song. <laughs> with my buddy, and I recorded on a tape cassette, and I gave it to Diane, but it was actually a praise song, but you'll love the lyrics of this song. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart. Like, I, like I'm giving, you know, I sang this for God, but I'm like, this subtle message will get across. I'm actually saying it to her, you know. There's none like you. There's no one that touched. Oh, she's not impressed. I can tell. But then one day it occurred to me, I look back at all those moments 
where I was madly in love with her and did all these things for her, you know what I realized? So much of it was about me. I did those things saying, I give this to you because I love you. It's for you, for your joy. But I did it because of the feeling I got. I was like on cloud nine. I was so happy. Oh, I'm so in love when I sing this song and give it to her. You know, I didn't realize, but it was because of how it made me feel. Many years have passed, and I no longer sing like that for her. (laughs) Things that I used to do, I give, have changed. Some of those things I don't give to her anymore. Nowadays, she complains, why don't you play the guitar at home anymore? You know, things have changed. But you know what what has also changed? It occurred to me as I was meditating on this issue that, you know what? I really want to just now try to, in a little way, show love to her, not for me, but truly for her. Even the little things that I say to her, before it was really like, oh, it just made me feel a certain way. Oh, I'm in this love. But I actually want to say some, like say things to her now where it's like, you know, it doesn't have to be about what you do for me. It doesn't have to be about how you make me feel. But you've given that love to me already so much. I just want to be able to just totally focus on you and just say that, honey, I think you are truly an amazing person, loving person. And when I say that, it won't be about me at all. Very in small ways, it's starting to become like that. Now, why I share this love story of mine is because I've done the same with God too. I lived at church when I was in high school. Friday night till Sunday night, I'm at church. I don't go anywhere else. I'm at church. Saturday all day, praise team. After praise team, we hang out. After praise team, we do things. I was always at church Friday to Sunday. Mission trip every summer. Retreat every summer. Sunday school teacher. Everything. And I did it. I saying, God, I love you. You know, you, I do this for you. But it made me realize in the same way that I felt about Diane and realized about Diane, that's what I was doing. Yes, my genuine love for God was mixed in it too. But so much of it, even though I didn't realize, was about me. It made me feel good. It made me feel satisfied. That's not a bad thing, but it was about me ultimately. But now I'm starting to experience just very little by little, not like amazing because I'm still so far away, but just in little ways I'm starting to just desire and hope that, God, I would just do this Even if I don't get any praise back, even if I don't get anything back, I wish, I pray that I'll just be able to do this so that God's people meet you and that will make you happy. And it will be about you, no longer about me. And this is why with straight face I can preach for so long because it's not about me. I want to just please Him and hopefully somehow you get it and you get close to God. That makes Him feel really good and and, and happy. Then that's all I need now. And then, through this whole process, this song came to my mind. I think the Spirit dropped it in my head. And the lyrics of this song go something like this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Your mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. New every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. Great is your faithfulness. Do you guys know this song? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Your mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. 
Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. Great is your faithfulness. I don't have to worry about me becoming bored again with the Bible. I don't have to worry about this, you know, relationship becoming stale. Why? Because this God, there's no end to Him, you know. Two things I, I tell our one of people that I say to make a point, and that point is this. The moment that I feel like God is not close to me and it stays that way, I'll do one of two things. Number one, I'll disappear. Somehow find Him and bring Him back into this community. Second thing, if that doesn't happen, I will step down. I say this to make a point, not to say that that will happen. But even that question now I know is wrong. Because God is saying, am I a book? That's not going to happen. I'm going to continue to experience this newness of God every day of my life from the moment I die to be with Him. And I don't have to worry about that. Yes, some days it'll feel slow, but I don't have to worry about that. He's unlimited, unending. I will continue to experience Him in new ways. community, I'll end, end with this, that is stuck in the first question, the joy disappears in that community. And complaints and grumbling begin to appear. And those are just small embers of complaints and grumbling, but they soon turn into a wildfire and burns up the whole church. Community that is stuck in the first question. You're just discussing the first question answers. And you're now insisting the answer to the first question. And we all become so dogmatic that it's got to be this way, that way, that way. If not this way, then this is not good. That's what happens. Community that moves on to the second question, where we're continuing to grow and experience our personal knowledge of Christ. Joy is there. Embers of complaints and grumbling are there too, but the living water of the Holy Spirit overwhelmed them, and that complaint and grumbling spirit, anger, frustration, division, all dissipate and disappear because of the living water of the Holy Spirit. I want to be a pastor for you, and pastor that continues to encounter this Jesus, and whose encounter with Him doesn't stop. I want to be a pastor that guides you in this journey, and I pray that we'll be a community where we continue to do this together. So here's our takeaway. It's incomplete sentence, because I don't know how else to finish this sentence. Not yesterday's knowledge, but today's encounter with Jesus. How many of you live off your past experience of faith, past knowledge, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Many years ago, I did this. I, I used, you know, and then today, there's, there's no encounter of Jesus. The sure way to die as a church and as a God, as a community of God. Not yesterday's knowledge, but today's encounter. But ask yourself, why am I not moving into today's encounter? Is it because I'm stuck in my first question? Am I stuck in my dogma? Am I stuck in my past experience? Am I stuck in my own desire and what I think should happen with my faith and my life? You're so stuck that Jesus can't take you to the second question. Where everything happens. Where everything happens. So I want to invite you to bring those walls down and move into the second question of faith by singing our last song together as the praise team leads us. Would you stand with us?